Every story that's ever been told has a beginning. And for this particular story, it all started off with an afternoon trip with my little niece, Mia Grace. Hi, Uncle Hey, let's go. Jump on in. Perfect. All right, now can you see? I, 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 don't, I don't know how to buckle. You don't? Okay, I'll help you out, okay? Okay. I thought we would be committed for... Mia, where are we going today? To the zoo. Yeah. Yeah. What what kind of what kind of animals and stuff do you want to go see today? I want to go see giraffes and stuff. So what's your second favorite animal ever? Crocodiles. Crocodiles. Why do you like crocodiles? Okay, you gonna skip the whole way there? Yep. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I think he's sleepy. You think he's what? I think he's sleepy. He does look like he's sleeping, huh? I'm looking for the rat. The rat. Okay? And where are they? Yeah, they're this way. I found them. Now, I had gone to zoos many times as a kid. And I always remember them being a positive experience. Look, I see them. Whoa, there they are. But as our day went on, I saw it in a completely different way. And so did Mia. Seeing how things are, I run into you. Animal after animal looked depressed and yearning to get out. Look! Is it the lions? How did I never see it like this before? It was hard to even watch. What started as pure excitement slowly turn to sorrow. Why are you so sad, kiddo? Because, because the animals are stuck in cages and I want them to get out. Where do you want them to go? Back home. Where's back home? In the jungle. The jungle? Uh-huh. Yeah. And then she said something to me during lunch that melted my heart. So what are you free of, Uncle? I naturally said what any uncle would say. Of course I'll try. And after she smiled at me, I knew I had to do whatever it took. Unfortunately, I knew virtually nothing about freeing animals from captivity. But luckily, I know a few people that do. I mean, I think captivity is one of the scariest words in, in, in the English language and the human language of people. I think when you think of it for, for people, you know, it brings up anxiety, it, it brings up anger, it brings up deep fear, um, it, it, it brings up the idea of panic. 
and uh, it's, it's a horrible, terrible thing for any living creature to experience. Nothing likes to be captured. Nothing likes to be enclosed and told what they can or cannot do. Animals, it's been proven, feel pain. Fish and whales, they feel pain. They feel suffering. Therefore, they're feeling creatures. They all have feelings, so therefore they are suffering. So therefore, you're imposing suffering on that animal just for your own personal enjoyment and for a monetary gain of some organization. To go and see them laying around in a cage is not the way that these animals are meant to exist and they're not meant to be presented to us that way. Being held in such tight quarters, even to the human eye if it doesn't seem like it, if they seem like they have enough room, you put a human in a situation like that where they can't move or they can't do what they want to do, they're going to go crazy. I mean, and it's proven, it's happened. So you think animals are no different and, and some people do and that, that's not okay because they aren't. The animals are smart. Animals are aware of their surroundings, some more than others. I think people have to make a conscious effort and understand what it is they're supporting. You know, dollars and cents uh, uh, basically, you know, feed into whatever it is, you know, whether it be a circus, uh, animal show, a, a street performer, a zoo, or whatever it is, you know, anybody that's, that's partaking in that by, by participating and paying an admission, paying a ticket fee, paying anything to do with, um, with those companies, organizations that are associated with that behavior, are uh, fueling those industries. Now with the making of any film, doing research is imperative. So I set out and visited zoos and sea life parks all across the United States to see if indeed they were just like the experience I had with my niece. And unfortunately, most of them were even worse. Many of the animals I witnessed either looked depressed or simply had no emotion at all. A good portion of the enclosures were clearly too small for the animals that lived in them. At one zoo in particular, there was a penguin display that was in temperatures of over 100 degrees. All the other penguins were hiding in the little tunnels from the scorching heat. But there was one that just sat there, looking right at me, as if to make sure that he was not going to be forgotten. Walking away, I looked back and saw him trying to swim after me. It was heart-wrenching. Then at a sea life park, I saw what broke my heart the most. Two bottlenose dolphins were forced to perform for a cheering crowd in an area that was smaller than most public swimming pools. After the show was over, I found the dolphins in a back pool that couldn't have been bigger than 10 by 15 feet. And after talking to one of the employees, this is where they said they spent about 90% of their time. No enrichments to play with, nothing. This was their miserable existence. I have to be honest, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go to zoos and I used to think it was so cool to, to see these lions and tigers and and bears, you know, in these, in these cages, you know, but when I was a kid, I didn't think about that as being a cage. I just thought of that as being their home. But the older I got, uh, the more I realized how, how unbelievably wrong that is. I think there are certain marine animals that are easier to be kept in captivity than others. Little reef fish, you know, shells, uh, obviously coral, you know, things that don't move around a whole lot and, and are happier in a very small space. But when you're talking about dolphins, whales, 
they need an ocean to travel in. They cannot be kept. I don't think there is an enclosure that can be big enough, deep enough to hold a whole family of orcas. I mean, you're welcome to try. I mean, if, if you can build something that's the size of a small ocean, then maybe that would be appropriate. But it's just impossible to give them the hunting grounds and the places for a whole family to interact. And it's the same with dolphins. They live in huge pods, and um, this is the only way that they can be happy and healthy. They need a family. I don't really believe you should be locking up polar bears or lions or tigers or apes or... I mean, that's... In this day and age, we, we don't need that to, to learn. I think if we, have, if we have wild animals and we can't rehabilitate them into the wild, then the, the best service that we can provide for them is sanctuary. And, and I know that we could really get into a long logistical conversation about what's a zoo and what's sanctuary. And it has a lot to do with you know, the amount of space that animals have, the ability to exercise, the ability to have companionship. And with, with most animals are social creatures and not loners. Um, and I think that there's not very much educational that we can teach kids through zoos and circuses and, and aquatic marine parks. I think that's kind of a big myth. I think that, you know, you take your kids to a park like that and they just see what it's like for a huge, amazing land mammal to be a prisoner in a small, cold, you know, sterile environment. Um, but I think kids can learn from sanctuary. I honestly feel like if if kids knew as much as most adults do about zoos and circuses and marine parks, they'd be really angry at us for letting that go on. Now I'm not saying that all aspects of every zoo and sea life park are completely bad. There are some elements of education that can be instrumental in getting people to care about animals. But after speaking with the experts, there clearly needs to be a reanalyzing of what animals should and should not be kept in captivity. I think that zoos, their indirect benefits for education can be beneficial if they're done in the right way. Again, though, that can be tainted by how an animal adapts to its life in a zoo. Animals, when they are stressed out, exhibit these things called coping behaviors. They're also known as abnormal response behaviors. Um, they can be frustration-induced or malfunction-induced related to the environment they're in. And they range depending on what species you're talking about. For most carnivores, or felid species, it's locomotive related, so it's moving, it's pacing. Whereas in undulates and different hoofed species, it's more mouth related. Even in primates, they, they do different things with their mouths that aren't normal. There has been no study that has completely eliminated these behaviors in, in caged animals. Animals with large home ranges definitely should not be kept in captivity. These animals are used to moving long distances, whether it's for territory, for mating, or to follow a prey species. They're not able to do that in captivity. Lions, tigers, wolves, um, polar bears, elephants, I mean, any of these species that want to get out and go and they can't, they're going to show an increased rate of these behaviors. So they have these coping behaviors that are a way for the animal to deal with what's going on. And it's not normal. It's not something that's seen necessarily in the wild. It's not something humans should be seeing and thinking is normal. When you go to a zoo and you see a large tiger or a panther, anything pacing back and forth, it's not happy. It's trying to get away. It's trying to hide or it's trying to move, which it would do normally in the wild. So these stress you know, induced behaviors, they're exactly what they are, stress induced. The main reason for most animal struggles is coping with their pens. And as I did some digging into the laws of the United States, as far as space requirements, was I ever shocked to see what I found. According to the Animal Welfare Act, 
which was passed in 2013. When it comes to large land mammals, there is no specific rules for each animal or even species. There is just simple language that says, enclosures shall be constructed and maintained so as to provide sufficient space to allow each animal to make normal, postural, and social adjustments with adequate freedom of movement. And according to the Department of Agriculture, each zoo and sea life park is checked and regulated at least once a year. Therefore, according to the laws that protect these animals, this space is completely legal, this space is completely legal, and somehow this space is completely 100% legal. Of course, every story has at least two sides. So I sat down with some of the people who work and run some of the largest sea life parks and zoos in the nation to get their side. I think zoos have a really important place in, in the world today. Uh, so many children nowadays can't get outside to play. It's, it's, it's a more scary world, according to all the grown-ups. Um, and so we need to provide them with safe places where they can encounter nature, and zoos are an important part of that. I definitely get a lot of people saying that SeaWorld needs to be shut down, needs to be condemned for having these animals in captivity. And uh, I, I just really hope that we can reach some of those people, and let them know that there's more than one perspective out there. A lot of people don't understand how large our rescue program actually is. We have sea otters that come from Monterey that send them to us to help them rehabilitate. We rescue hundreds of pinnipeds a year. I mean, we have a rescue shark, the birds that we rescue. Uh, we constantly get sea turtles coming in from up north. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a far larger program than people even realize. So not all zoos are the same. There are roadside zoos, there are people who have wild animal collections in their backyards in some states. But if you go to an AZA accredited zoo, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, this is a group of folks who work together to provide great animal care. They set high standards for themselves, but not every zoo is an AZA member. I know that a low percentage of zoos actually adhere to AZA standards, so it would be nice to see maybe some other government oversight that encourages them to come up to those standards instead of meeting the bare minimums of some of the government regulations. Talking about which animals should be in captivity and which should be in the wild is a very tough question. Working in the environment that I work in, we've talked about that amongst ourselves. And yes, we would love to see these animals in the wild, but you also have to realize that animals that were born in captivity and haven't been introduced to how they would survive in the wild would really struggle living in the wild. The experts have to sit down and talk. And those are the type of talks that need to happen. Modern zoos aren't really collecting animals from the wild, which has been a criticism in the past. Now we have self-sustaining populations. Even though there are a lot of folks who are, that, that question the value of zoos and have some valid criticisms of how zoos are operating, I think it's coming from a place of care and compassion for wildlife and it's the same care and compassion that we in the zoo community have. And I know that we all can work together to find out what is the best way to take care of these animals um, while helping to preserve them for the future. And though it was obvious we would never agree on everything, we clearly all want what's best for the animals. And the only way that we're gonna find these answers is to get experts on both sides to continue making strides forward to finding a compromise that everybody can support together. But for all the horrific ways animals are held captive and exploited, the worst of all is something that most of us have grown up watching at some point in our childhood. It poses as something mysterious and wonderful, a visual spectacular right near your own backyard, the circus. 
Circuses visit just about every corner of the planet where families are willing to cough up money to see their traveling animals. These animals are pretty much treated like criminals or prisoners. They're crammed in tiny little containers for days upon days in trucks or trains. Growing up as a kid, for sure, I was into the circuses, but you know, after about 10 years old, when I, when I began to realize what went into those animals being trained for people's pleasure, I mean, it's nothing, you know, it, it's nothing better than what humans done to other races of people. To go to a circus and to see animals in performing in acts that they really have no business performing in is really discredit and disrespect to some of nature's greatest creatures. And it's also not the way we should be teaching our children to see these animals. You're doing the children and the animals both a big disservice. You look at uh, Circus LA, you know, um, the guy that started that, Guy, he's the king of the circus and it's the greatest circus on the planet, you know, and they don't use a single animal, you know. Uh, they use humans that choose to do it, not animals that are forced to do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, circus, circuses could absolutely thrive. I mean, that's proof they can thrive without animals. You know what, I actually never really grew up going to the circus. Uh, even at a young age, I always felt that there was something shady going on. You know, even as a kid, yeah. I felt, well, wait, how, how is that elephant standing on that small little bucket? You know what I mean? Like, that small little tin can, whatever they stand on, and the older I got, I started seeing, you know, footage of just the, the abuse, the torture that these animals go through to learn how to do um, certain things, you know, and it's just, it's just so, it's just so wrong, you know, I mean, it's just, I can't believe that this day and age that we're, I mean, we are, absolutely smart enough to understand that this is wrong and it actually still still exists it still happens um, I mean yeah it's, it's just awful I think that circuses are wrong I don't think they should be around I think that is so old school and we have enough knowledge in this world now to know otherwise and to say that we don't is embarrassing on our part um, I don't I don't really care what what your motives are for them I mean animals in captivity alone is bad enough but then translocating them long distances and unnatural you know enclosures I think people need to not pay f to go see that and and again that just comes on knowledge but also just Find the part of a human in you that sees what's going on is wrong and act on that. If you don't even have to be a researcher or smart about it. Like, it's just not okay. There's animals who are basically, you know, taken captive and, and treated worse than prisoners, right? Per made to perform certain ways for food, for entertainment. The idea is to, is to basically say no, right? I mean, all you have to do is not show up. All you have to do is not pay the money. You know, there's a decision to be made. So circuses can even either get on board or basically there's gonna be sort of a rampage. Tyke the elephant uh, was brought to Hawaii on a barge. It was like numerous days in travel. Uh, got to Hawaii, arrived in a container, uh, you know, very tight quarters for an elephant, uh, was forced to perform in shows, doing unnatural acts. Uh, you know, these are wild and exotic animals, and so what Tyke did was act like a wild and exotic animal, but it just didn't fit 
uh, a ridiculous, frivolous, silly circus, and it didn't fit the streets of Honolulu. Uh, and so she ended up getting shot. She uh, killed her trainer in the arena. She roughed up the groom, almost killed him, uh, injured a whole bunch of people on her way out of the arena, ran through the streets of Kakak. It was close to a half an hour. Um, many, many shots were fired in public. Very, very dangerous situation. Lots and lots and lots of blood. Uh, hundreds of spectators screaming and yelling and horrified. Thousands of kids that were in the arena were, you know, witnessed this. I'm no animal expert, but I can certainly tell you there's no better feeling than freedom. And animals are certainly no different. I had seen so much pain and misery that I decided to take a trip to show everyone what wild, happy animals look like. is maybe you guys can tell me at home there is no feeling that compares to being out in the wild so so this is happening right now to watch a perfect working ecosystem right in front of you is thrilling and always humbling and if you search for long enough the universe is sure to provide you with moments that will change your life forever such as when a mother elephant trusts you enough to let her two-week-old baby play right next to you. Waiting at the door. If there's nobody else on the plane, is it considered a private jet? It's through these connections that you will see for yourself all the beauty and innocence that lives in these amazing creatures. Anybody speak whale? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? First time around. I believe it's important that we all feel what it's like to be completely insignificant. I had this feeling in Mexico when a gray whale swam right under our tiny boat. She could have easily capsized us, but instead chose to come interact with us and say hello. First time around. So it looks like there's about 30 or 40 Galapagos sharks. Um, a little more than I had anticipated. But I'm just gonna keep my heart rate down and see how it goes. Every day humans are connecting with creatures that were once thought to be completely hostile towards us. Let the good times roll. I'll never get tired of being around dolphins. They're the smartest animals I've ever encountered. They're one of the only animals on the planet 
that have fun simply because they can. While I was swimming, I couldn't help but think of the captive dolphins I had seen and how without our help, they will never again feel what it's like to be free. But for all the beauty I had seen on my adventure, there was something that was very apparent. Huge spaces of land where there was once trees that had been wiped out. And many places where locals said that sea life was plentiful in the ocean were now gone. As far as the land areas were concerned, this was due to deforestation. For those of you that don't know what deforestation is, it's cutting down the forest for usually one of three reasons. Industry, agriculture, and livestock. Now, the ecosystem is affected by these in many different ways, but it's important to remember that trees absorb carbon dioxide. And as we put more carbon in the atmosphere, we hinder the Earth's ability to bring a balance, causing temperatures around the globe to rise. But it's wildlife that's impacted the most by deforestation. Day by day, areas that wild animals have to live get smaller and smaller. Now, when we talk about the ocean reefs, which not only create oxygen, but they also absorb carbon dioxide as well. In fact, we get more than half the oxygen that we breathe every day from the ocean. And it's being heavily impacted because of overfishing and technology, which has allowed this on a massive scale with long lining and nets the size of multiple football fields. I come to realize that even if all the animals are free from captivity, Many of them have virtually no homes left to go to. Uh, long liners, bag netters, night divers, who, who do it for commercial, kind of wipes out the population. I've seen it. A lot of my friends seen it. What I would like to see is make bag netting illegal. Make netting period illegal. Almost every environmental issue or animal issue, there's a human issue that's very closely related. You know, we talk about uh, the loss of habitat, and it's often very related to poor people that are struggling just to feed their families that end up encroaching on habitats and sometimes cap capturing, whether it's poaching, whether it's captive wildlife to go to zoos and circuses, whether it's animals for food, whether it's rainforest uh, deforestation. These issues are all connected. We are causing extinction of animals and wildlife throughout this earth at any cost. We're producing, stripping, mining, taking, and the animals are the ones that suffer, along with humankind after. Once you realize that, oh, we killed off that, which kept that in check, and now we're on a downward spiral, we're messing it up for everybody. You know, preservation of our wild spaces, in addition to the preservation of the animals that enjoy these wild spaces, including us, is instrumental in our own survival. Because as these wild spaces disappear, as these beautiful animals, these wild and free beasts disappear, we're quick to follow. You know, this is not something that is along party lines. It's not Republican or Democrat. This is something that affects everyone. There's not a single person on this earth that does not get affected by our ecosystem. So this is something that we all have to get behind. It really is global. Over the last 40 years, we've lost about half the land wildlife and about 40% of marine species. We are currently on the precipice of losing most of the planet's majestic creatures. Yeah. <laughs>
Yet it was my last trip to Africa that I began to see a glimmer of hope. Governments around the world, but primarily in Africa, are now stepping up to protect their wild animals. Turns out governments have realized that their wild animals are worth much more alive than dead. Tourism dollars are flooding into many of these countries with people from all around the globe wanting to see wild animals in their natural habitat. I started off in Kenya where I met some extraordinary people who were not only changing the way that their cultures look at animals, but also changing old traditions as well. I love the fact that the government have been able to lay down some rules that animals should not be killed and, and like teaching the community on the importance of having wildlife. We had the Maasai community hunting lions just for them to be known that they are brave. As a warrior, we show the community they have a strong generation taking care of them by killing the lion. As a warriors, we are the first generation to receive education in our community. And we are making new warriors right now. Instead of warriors to go to the cave killing lions and girls being married at a young age, um, we are now encouraging both boys and girls to go to school. If you go all the way to the university, to the college, you get a diploma, you get a degree, then that's how we call you a warrior. When you come to this other side and see animals in their natural environment, you know how they interact, you know, having zebras, having wildebeest, having hyenas in the same field, it's something so unique. So our country also and our community and our world have to protect the endangered species because these animals also have a right to live. They have a right to be in the ecosystem. Yeah. In the Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, the mountain gorillas were quickly on their way to extinction. And just as their numbers had hit the lowest they had ever been a few years ago, a little less than 700, the government stepped in and have placed a shoot to kill order on anyone caught poaching the gorillas. Rangers now protect them year round, and for the last couple years, their numbers have started to rise. There are currently almost a thousand mountain gorillas, and they're finally looking like they might have a chance at a future. Then on a safari to Tanzania, I had an amazing tour guide named Douglas Simbaye. Douglas had a way of explaining things that simply just made sense. Uh, what I, I really like my guest to take away after doing a tour with me if it is possible, positive things. <laughs> and one is conservation issues, because I can see our natural habitat is dwindling. Especially like if you go to the outside national park where the local communities are. I believe that by spreading this news, people will be coming with opinions and the ideas about conservation. And the, on top of that, this is not only for Tanzanians. This is for everybody around the world. This is natural habitat that we have been given by God, so we should keep it. In a few years, like five to ten years, we have lost more than half population of elephants just because of human being, just because of money. They follow it until they are very close. They use the gun to shoot. 
And after it dies, they take the axe and cut and cut and cut. The illegal trade is being fueled by a growing demand from China, where ivory remains a highly prized status symbol. We don't learn from mistake. So we have black rhinos here, yeah? endangered species. And the, how have these rhinos become endangered species is through poaching. There were 500,000 rhinos across Africa and Asia. Now the number is closer to 29,000, and that number is shrinking every day. If just this month, a northern white rhino died. That leaves only six of them on the planet. You know, like a human being, we forget that we are, we are part of nature, but we are. And we don't, maybe because of the lifestyle and so forth, we don't realize there is always, always connectivity. Just imagine, yeah? If you don't love yourself, can you be happy? If you love yourself, you can love somebody else. So love starts by loving yourself first, and then it goes, you love somebody else, and then you love a bird, you love a tree, Talking about conservation now, cutting down a tree is much more easy, easier for you now. It becomes easier for you to deal with that. I'm not cutting down this tree because I love it. I'm not killing this elephant because I, I love it. I'm not stealing from this neighbor because I, I love him. They've been here for millions and millions of years. So for me, they take good care of the environment. The question arises when it comes to human. Are we doing the same thing the other creatures are doing? Or are we doing something that is opposite to what the others are doing? And the one last thing is, everybody is responsible to take good care of this planet. The answers are really quite simple. The future of humanity is tied to the land and the ocean of this planet, as well as the creatures that we share it with. By protecting the animals and our ocean along with the land, we'll be protecting ourselves, as well as the future generations of our children and their children. We must provide large sanctuaries for animals that cannot be released back into the wild. And if we want to view these animals, we must see them in their own backyard, on their terms not ours. Global conservation must be our end goal. However, we must also start locally. There are animal shelters such as the California Wildlife Center that need our help and support. Children especially can learn at places like the CWC, not only just about local animals in general, but how to rehabilitate them and release them back into the wild. Victoria Harris and I'm the current board president of the California Wildlife Center. We're a nonprofit uh, organization in Calabasas that's dedicated to the rescue, rehabilitation, and release of sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife. We're doing this seven days a week, and that's, you know, three shifts a day. That's a lot of shifts to cover. Um, and the same with the hospital staff that we currently have, I'm thinking, all with the exception of our vet, started as either an intern, an extern, or a volunteer. All the animals that we see, they're very important to the planet as far as the ecosystem goes, because the ecosystem is so tightly woven. So each species and each type of animal, I mean, they depend on another animal. And I feel that it is extremely important to maintain these types of facilities because we help to um, preserve the ecosystem. We help to preserve, you know, especially the predator species, you know, because they are the sentinel species and they kind of show how the health of the environment is going. And so if we don't care for these animals, um, we really threaten what the environment, the ecosystem is doing out there. In a perfect world, we wouldn't be here. People would value wildlife and the environment. And since the majority of the animals that come in here are in some way 
here because they were impacted by either habitat destruction or being hit by a car or people letting their cats out to catch birds or other animals. So in a perfect world, we would be out of business. For the last few years, for reasons unknown, thousands of starving and dying sea lions and elephant seals have been washing up along parts of the California coast. And because of places like the CWC, many of them are being given a second chance at life. Traditionally in the past, we'd, we would have seasons where you'd have uh, pups coming up and that would be a normal event. Every year you have animals that aren't gonna thrive, you have animals that are gonna die. And that's just something that we would rehabilitate and it would just be our normal course of business. But since 2013, what we have is just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of baby sea lions coming up starving to death. And there's not a whole lot wrong with them other than the fact that there's they're not getting food. Um, and the numbers are staggering. Normally we would see maybe 20 or 30 in the area for the winter time, and now we're seeing like 200 to 300. We have a rescue team that goes out and picks everything up. So we get a phone call, send out our rescue team. They go and assess the animal and decide if it actually needs to be rescued or not. And then once they are determined that they need to be rescued, then they're brought back here. And then the whole rehab process starts from there. Well, when I look into these animals' eyes, I see, I see ourselves. They're, they're very similar to us. They feel, they have emotions, they're intelligent, and um, they can suffer just like we can. So when I look into a suffering animal's eyes, I, I can feel that, um, and I, I wanna help. I feel an obligation to help. We give them a nice rinse off in the morning and then put them in the pools to have breakfast. So. Just keeps them a little cleaner before they get in the pools. And it wasn't until there was the unusual mortality event that they asked us to not only rescue them, but to do rehab here. To see them go from like 60 pounds when they came in and they were emaciated and dehydrated. And then you fast forward maybe three months and they're now, you're having to carry a 180 pound elephant seal pup out to be released. It's, um, it's pretty great. I mean, what I do is extremely fulfilling. That's, that's why I do it. I mean, every time we help an animal, Every time we release an animal, you know, it, it reminds me that we're, we're doing something that matters. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell my niece that I was able to free all the captive animals like she had asked me to. But at least I got the chance to take her to see the release of a group of rehabilitated sea lions and elephant seals. I like to believe that people are very intelligent beings and awareness and action are the two key ingredients in really creating a paradigm shift for people to understand that these beautiful animals don't belong in cages, that these beautiful animals need to be respected and that they really need to be wild and free how they belong. Let's change our zoos, let's change our way that we treat these captive creatures and make it more like their own environment for their for their mental state. And so all we have to do is say no, we're not going to go to the circus, we're not going to let you cut down the forests. Um, and, and with that basically we're all going to make a change. It's final and there's sort of no there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We all just have to stand up together. You know, and everybody has a voice that, that needs to be heard. I think people's, um, you know, knowledge needs to be brought into what's going on. I think their attitudes from that will change. And then from there, hopefully, there could be a behavior change, which would reduce the lack of knowledge on the part of the public about what zoos and aquariums and other things are doing. Um, and then from that, it's more likely to get a push on the government and different things to hold these places accountable for what they're doing. There is clearly a shift in the way that people are now seeing animals that are held in captivity. SeaWorld announced that orcas currently in our care will be the last generation of orcas at SeaWorld. And it seems like almost every day, changes for the better are happening across our nation. After 146 years, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus will have its final curtain call in May. The company says the ticket sales didn't match the cost of keeping the show going. Yeah, I know zoo critics are very passionate about what they believe in. Zoos are also very passionate about what we believe in. And I think the important thing is to focus on how we're treating the planet and to save those wild spaces for the animals, um, the oceans, the forests, the rainforests, the deserts, 
all these different habitats are coming under threat because of our actions. So if we can look at what we can do as consumers to you know, make good seafood choices and use fewer resources and save energy, we can then keep those wild animals out in the wild where we'd all love to see them. Unlike many selfish and self-serving people of the past, our future generations have spoken and they will no longer stand for people to sit back and be willfully ignorant. Chinese ruled Hong Kong voted on Wednesday to ban ivory sales in the world's largest ivory retail market. You know, people know what they know and that's it and that's not their fault. But once you know, then you know and you, you can be part of the, the solution. I think that we've reached a tipping point. I think most people really understand that, that, that we've got these incredible, majestic, sentient beings. Many of them are endangered on the endangered species list, and we can do a lot better by them than watching them toss a ball around or, 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 or jump through a hoop. You know, I think that they've earned our dignity and our respect, and we, we need them, you know, and we need to understand them from a, a very a lot philosophical way if we hope to maintain these natural habitats that actually still exist. There is now a clear understanding that all living creatures deserve to be treated with respect and compassion and not like slaves for entertainment. Hey Uncle Philly. Yeah kiddo. Thanks. Oh of course. We are all given this one opportunity at this thing called life. Let's make it count. Not only for all the amazing creatures, but also for the planet that many of us have taken for granted and are so fortunate to call our home.